why we have academic protections or academic free speech and tenure in colleges because one person said Dr. Small doesn't even deserve to be a college professor simply because of a position that I hold. Now, Dr. Brown told you he was married, so I'll tell you that I'm not married. Dr. Brown told you he was straight, I believe, so I'll tell you that I'm straight. But I'll tell you why I'm doing this and why I talk about this, but I'll do those things later. I just wanted to mention that Dr. Brown and I are both, I think, and the only reason why I say I think is because Dr. Brown and I were in the restroom and he said, oh, Dr. Small, you're dressed so nicely. And I said, Dr. Brown, this is not the place for a come on. And then he mentioned again how nicely dressed I am. So, Dr. Brown, that's a little joke. Calm down. Calm down. <laughs> Calm down, Dr. Brown. Yes, it's a joke. I'll marry you. I'll marry you. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's a joke. And the only reason why I can joke like this is because I'm comfortable with my sexuality. I'm straight. And I think Dr. Brown is straight. And I believe that he's comfortable with his sexuality, even if he is red right now. So, so let's talk about some things here. In response to what Dr. Brown said, this history lesson, their marriage has been the same way throughout history. So what is the justification for change in marriage? And what I'll say to Dr. Brown is this, if all you have is history as your justification for not changing an institution, then you don't have very much. And the reason why I point that out it's because we had many institutions in this country and in others for long periods of time and there was a point at which we came in our society that we decided that those institutions, although they were around for a long time, needed to be changed. And of course slavery is an example of that. Slavery was around before America was even around, no? And we decided at some point that history in and of itself it's not a justification for keeping the institution the way that it is. And so, Dr. Brown, I will say to you, all you've done is given us a history lesson, but you haven't given us a justification for keeping the institution the way that it is. And I gave you a justification for changing the institution. In fact, you agreed with it. You said, sure, same-sex couples or gay people participate in society, but we are not treating them unequally when we don't let them participate in the benefits of societies. Dr. Brown, I'll point out to you that's the very definition of treating people unequally. Because African Americans participated in society and we didn't let them enjoy the benefits equally. So, does sexuality matter or does gender matter? The answer to that is this. Look, Dr. Brown, in talking to you about gender, gave you a lot of statistics, and he gave you a lot of facts about what people have said, and he said that these things are the facts, is the way he put it. There's a problem here, Dr. Brown. It seems to me that either you are dishonest or your research is not astute. First, I don't think that you're dishonest because I talk to you, and you strike me as a very honest person. Also, don't think that you're uncaring because I've talked to you and you strike me as a very caring person. I do have to question your research, though, because five minutes on the internet will reveal to any of us that there is research on Dr. Brown's side that says the things that he wants that research to say. And five more minutes on the internet will reveal to you that there is research on the side that I am articulating. Indeed, I did this for the purposes of determining if I could find contradictory or very complex research. And I did. And I did. And so what I'll do, instead of telling you the research shows that, as Dr. Brown did, show, the research shows that these are the facts, I'll offer you an explanation of the complexities of the research. Because both of us can pre present research for our sides. When it comes to gender, when it comes to raising children, when it comes to being born gay and innate ideas and all of those things that Dr. Brown talked about, put them in the research category. And what, the, and what we find is that there, research on, that there is research on both sides. And the reason why is because the conditions for raising a child properly are multi-varied and they're multifaceted. And the people who are being raised themselves are multi-varied. That is, there's no blueprint for raising a child. Certainly the people who have children know this. Of course, there's no blueprint for having a, for, for having a successful marriage. Those of you who are married also know this. 
So what we need, instead of presenting the information as if there are only facts on one side and not facts on the other, or, or as if the research is all pro Dr. Brown and anti Dr. Small, because we could get into a pro nay back and forth. He'd say yes, I'd say no. He'd say yes, I'd say no. And then he might say my research is flawed and I'll say that his research is flawed. And we'd do that for the next 30 minutes and you'd leave here thinking that conversation went nowhere. So instead of doing that to you, what I'll do is point out that because raising children, having a successful marriage and all of those things are very complex and idiosyncratic to the people who are being raised or the people who are in the marriage, what we need when we're talking about doing this properly is to provide children and those people with the necessities of life. Education, a safe, loving home environment, and so on and et cetera. And in addition to that, what we need are parents who are responsive to the needs of their particular children. Same-sex couples and opposite-sex couples can do both of those things. He talked a lot about procreation. I know a lot of gay people with children, so they obviously can procreate. And certainly they can procreate through the alternative means of procreation, like in vitro fertilization or surrogate motherhood. So if all your claim, Dr. Brown, for the grounds of being married is simply procreation, Gay people are already doing it because I know many with kids and certainly there are alternative me methods to reach those ends. Thank you. All right, and thank you, Dr. Small, for your responses. At this point, we're going to shift gears a little bit and move into a question and answer period. And the way this is going to work is, for, first, Dr. Brown will have the opportunity to ask Dr. Small questions for six minutes. Then we'll switch, and Dr. Small will be able to ask Dr. Brown questions. While this process is going on, we want you to formulate questions for both of the speakers. If you have a question, please raise your hand. An attendant will bring you a note card and a writing utensil. Write down your question. During directed at one, not both, but one of the speakers. Those questions will be brought to me, and then after this questioning period, I will field those questions or direct them towards the speakers. With that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Brown once more to ask questions of Dr. Brown. All right. Thank you, sir. Just for the record, I forgive you for the hot air comment. All right. Um, what is the importance of the number two when it comes to marriage? Why two if marriage is not the union of a man and a woman? Okay. Maybe I should walk here. But he said, what's the, the question is, what's the importance of the number two? Again, I suspect this is the uh, polygamy claim. I'm just asking a simple uh, question. Okay, why, why do we define marriage, before we even get anywhere else, why do we define marriage as two people, if not for the obvious a man and woman coming together sure. for responsible procreation? Sure. This, I think, is the polygamy claim. I, again, I told the people who organized this that I wouldn't get, but I'm going to tell you something about the question in a second, but I told the people who organized this that I wouldn't get off into conversations about those things. They asked me not to, so I'm not going to. But... What I will say about this polygamy claim is that it results in what's called a red herring fallacy. Excuse me, it's not a polygamy claim. I didn't ask that question. I'm not yes. asking a word about polygamy. Okay. I didn't say it. I'm not thinking it. I simply well, asked you, great. why is marriage defined as two people? Because I have constantly, from beginning to end of my presentation, have given justification great. for marriage. Although you say I haven't, I've given it perpetually, and everyone here can recognize that. So uh -huh. the question is... Why do we define marriage as the union of two people if it's not male and female? Great. Okay. He's asking why do we define marriage as a union of two people without any other claims behind it. The easy answer to that is we've simply defined marriage that way and the question about other things have not yet come up. If it does, I'll be happy to debate you when it does come up. Oh, okay. So there's no reason why it's two. It could theoretically just as well be three or four. Theoretically. Theoretically, sure. Okay, thank you. That answers my question wonderfully. All right, next question, sir. Um, as far as society is concerned, is there any difference between same-sex marriage and heterosexual marriage? Okay, I can't speak for all society because I suspect that what different people, different people in society will have different positions on this. So you, so you wanted to know whether or not as far as society is concerned, there are differences. Well, I can't speak for all society. And to the question of whether or not they'll think differently, the answer to that is obviously yes. How do we know? Because it's reflected.